Welcome to Indie Capital. I'm Pamela Nash, and today I'm talking to Eduardo Sanchez, who is of uh, Lovely Molly, VHS2. Mm -hmm. um, what else? We have Exists coming out. Yes. Um, and I want to get to what you've got going on. I want to talk to you first, though, about the thing that I feel like you're pretty well known for right now in the industry, and that is you kind of made that found footage, first person genre completely soar. Um, we were talking a little bit before about the, the history of it was like a handful of films that tried to make that genre work. And then Blair Witch comes out, blows it out of the stratosphere, and there were 67 films that came <laughs> after that. Paranormal Activity has a five film franchise yeah. off of a genre that didn't really work until yeah, you yeah, did we, something with yeah, it. Yeah, Dan, Dan, my partner, and I pop, definitely popularized it. And it was, uh, for us, it was just kind of uh, you know, an experiment. You know, we, we had this idea, the first thing was, was that, you know, this was the early 90s and there hadn't really been uh, many great horror films for a while, at least films that like had scared us. And uh, Dan and I really loved, you know, the old kind of movies like The Exorcist and Shining and Jaws. And uh, but we also loved this kind of, uh, kind of reality genre that happened in the 70s, which with a show, it centered around a show called In Search Of. Which was, which was narrated by Leonard Nimoy. It was basically like a you know, paranormal cryptozoology kind of show that basically investigated all these weird things. But they investigated them as a documentary, as like they're, them being real. And you know, we talked to, these, to the guys who did In Search of later, and they, were, they, they, they admitted they stretched the truth a little bit. So, but they're not, there was nothing really that scared us as much as those shows because they were reality-based. So Dan and I, in film school in the early 90s, we were kind of like thinking, you know, could we do something like that? Could we do a movie? that um, pretended to be real, that was a documentary. And uh, then the idea for Blair Witch kind of came about. And we put it on hold for a while. Dan and I were still in school. We had finished, we were finishing other films. Um, and then or some, sometime around 96, uh, I was in a dead-end job and I was kind of frustrated and I was like, you know, let's do one more film and see what happens. And, and you know, Blair was kind of the best idea we had. So we shot it and uh, it was supposed to be more of a, of a traditional documentary. Like there was the, the stuff in the woods with the kids, with the filmmakers, and then there was like supposed to be a whole documentary based on the you know, police footage and, and you know, the investigation, interviews with the parents and family members. Um, but then we realized as we were editing the film that we didn't need all this other stuff. Um, and we actually shot a bunch of stuff, um, but we just ended up kind of discarding it and using it later for a, a, a Sci-Fi Channel special, one to, for mark, to market the, the Blair Witch Project. Um, but for us, it was just kind of like you know discovering this thing that worked. Um, and, and what's funny is that there was a movie called Cannibal Holocaust, which I think was done in 1979, um, and it was banned in the United States. It's like a, I think it's an Italian film, and. Um, after, after Blair Witch premiered at Sundance, somebody sends us the VHS. They're like, you know, somebody emailed me and said, have you ever seen Cannibal Holocaust? I'm like, no, we've never seen it. So they sent us the movie, and the movie's pretty gruesome. I mean, they do a lot of, it, it, you can see pretty clearly why it was banned in the United States. But the, the, the story is pretty much exactly the same as Blair Witch, except these people are going to go see cannibals. I think like in South America somewhere, or Central America. So, and it's basically this documentary team that goes in, goes to South America and they've never heard from again. And then their footage is found. And uh, it's funny because I tell people this a lot. It's like if, we, if Dan or I had seen that movie, we would have never done Blair Witch because mm. it would have been like, well, somebody's already done that, it didn't work, or it, it worked, but we can't do it again. And we would have just done something else and you know, who knows what, happened, what would have happened. But um, yeah, to, to, for me, for, for Dan and me, it was mostly, um, you know, it was a good idea, and we executed it. You know, we got and we got exactly the right partners, and uh, but it was to it was a total experiment. We had no idea it was going to work, and you know, it was just kind of we're just kind of rolling the dice with it. Well, how do you get actors to act like they're not acting? Well, it, the, the acting thing was, you know, the auditioning was kind of unique because, and, and actually, I've used the same technique for other films, even though they're not improvisational. Is the idea that. You know, there's uh, there's great actors, um, that, you know, for different kinds of things, and we found that like really solid actors that we knew um, that could do kind of dramatic normal stuff were not so good at like f feeling real. So what we did was we auditioned in New York and Orlando, Florida, where we were based, and we uh, auditioned in L.A. for a little bit. But in New York, we basically just had people come in. 
and we gave them these kind of instruction uh, sheets before uh, they went in and they said, and it basically said, as soon as you come into the audition space, you're auditioning. So as soon as they would come in, we would set, we, we would set up some scenario, we'd say, hey, hello, and you know, you're, you, you, you come to us, you're, in a, you're like a parole hearing, and they would have to kind of explain why they want to be released from prison. Um, and then we would switch to, you know, uh, oh, you just scored a, you know, a perfect 10, you know, in that dive or whatever, how do you feel? And then they would have to turn into like a, you know, like an Olympic, you know, swimmer or a diver. Um, and we just kind of took them through all these situations just to see how they could, qu how quickly they could, you know, think on their feet. And some people were great. And a lot of people just had no idea that even in the middle of the thing, they'd be like, is this the audition? I mean, what am I doing here? So there was a lot of, uh, you know, you, you, we got a lot of insight into like how we were going to direct these people and also what kind of actors we needed. Um, so, you know, so it basically just, we, we, we auditioned like a thousand people and this was totally like cattle call. New York City, you know, tiny room kind of auditioning with a line out the door, and this is, you know, before the internet. So it was kind of like people would just line up and come in, and we, you know, eventually over like the not, you know, left three or four months, we whittled it down to the three filmmakers, the three, three actors that we picked for the movie. And this film took off like in such unexpected ways. It's got like its fan thing, and there's a, a video game, and so many things coming mm -hmm. off of it, and awards all over the country, and you're going to Cannes, and ha what was your reaction to all of that kind of attention from something that you guys were like, well, let's just see if we can do it? Uh, the, you know, the reaction was crazy. I mean, it was just something where, um, you know, you, you uh, after a while, you kind of get numb because you kind of have to turn yourself off because there's just there's just no more like oh my god that you can you know that can come out of you i mean the you know we knew we had something cool because we had um you know we were building this website and we were getting a lot of reaction for the website and um and then we got into sundance and then we we realized okay we're gonna have something cool here but we had no idea i mean we, we didn't even plan the movie to go to the theaters that's why people are always like Why'd you make the movie so shaky? You know, people were throwing up in the theaters. I'm like, dude, we never imagined that this thing was going to be in the movie theater. I mean, we thought it was just going to be on video, you know, uh, if we were lucky. Because uh, our whole goal was just like, let's just get a you know, video deal and then we can, you know, hopefully make enough money to make another movie. So when it kind of started, it went to Sundance and it was kind of this big movie at Sundance and sold after like its first screening. And... Um, you know, the, the, the artists and the distribution company kind of reintroduced the website and it started kind of getting very popular and people were calling me and saying, hey, this is your movie, I can't believe it. I just heard, you know. Um, so then once, you know, we realized that it was crazy and actually one of our, uh, somebody that we went to film school with called us like a couple of, about a month, month and a half before the movie came out and she was like, she worked at some studio or some kind of company that had, that gauged, um, the market, like how, because movies have a certain kind of rating before they come out, like they kind of know what numbers they're going to do. And he, and she was like, do you know that your movie is, is, is rating better than some of these $80 million movies that are coming out? Like people know about it more. Like they basically ask people, have you heard of this movie? Are you going to go see it? And that's how kind of they gauge, you know, how popular a movie is going to be. So when she told us that, we were like, wow, this is, this could be really crazy. And then when the movie came out and it was, you know, they, they, they launched it on one screen at the Angelica on when, on, in, uh, in June, I think, in, in New York. And every single Showtime was sold out. And then it opened on like three screens for the weekend. And crazy, you know, average per screen average for the time. And uh, so we, you know, there was like this craziness. And then everything else was just like, you know, multiple explosions going off. Um, and, you know, you literally go from um, being you know, a completely, a totally struggling filmmaker. Um, and, and really, and, and, and we, you know, we were having our power cut off or our water cut off. Like every other month, we'd have some utility that we wouldn't pay and we couldn't pay. Um, to go from that to have this, you know, these, this movie that is on, you know, 1,600 screens and um, everybody's talking about it. And, you know, you're meeting, you know, we were meeting people like, you know, Roger Ebert, you know, is loving the film. I mean, yeah, it's like a dream come true. And it, it was something that, for us that we never, we never imagined, you know, like, like before Blair Witch, probably the biggest success was, you know, maybe Robert Rodriguez with El Mariachi or Kevin Smith with Clerks. But you look at what those movies did and what Blair Witch did and Blair Witch was just like, there was nothing else like it. So we couldn't even, we couldn't even dream that big. 
Um, so once we got past the whole idea of like this movie is actually competing with you know with movies that cost you know thousands of times more than than it, um, we you know we were we knew we were in new territory and we were just kind of trying to enjoy it. Like I remember Dan and me like you know you know in in Cannes or in Toronto or wherever we were at them you know and just kind of looking at each other and saying this is never gonna happen to us again. So, you know, let's just enjoy it and, you know, try not to get too crazy, you know. Um, but it was life-changing, you know, it was life-changing and, you know, and it was also a scary time because for the first time ever, your, you know, your film is gonna be um, seen by a worldwide audience and you know that your next film is gonna, seen, is gonna be seen by the same audience. So, it, you know, it was, it's just very scary to have like this very uh, limited kind of access to what you're doing to all of a sudden everybody's gonna see it. So it's very, it's, it's like, just, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's part of the reason why we didn't do any films for so long after Blair Witch is that there was this kind of um, trepidation as far as like moving forward, and because you know, all of a sudden it wasn't just making films for your family or making films for everybody, and it was you know, it's just a, a frightening thing to have this child that you care for out and to be criticized and to be maligned by people, you know. It's interesting that you point out, like, you initially you make it for your friends and your family because you guys are kind of considered, like, pioneers in leveraging the internet to get the word out about your film, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kevin Smith didn't really have that. Well, that was, yeah, it was before <laughs> the internet. Yeah, I mean, look, yeah. our thing was, it was 99, so, you know, 88 and 98 and 99, so basically we had, it was the perfect time. This is before YouTube and before, you know, Facebook and, and anything. You know, the web was, like, you know, a percentage of what it, what it is now. Um, but there was, you know, there weren't, there weren't these big app channels, but also there wasn't as much clutter. So you could kind of make your way through it. And we just built a website because that's the only thing, you know, that we could afford to, to, uh, to, to, you know, to market our film with. So you had, I mean, once you kind of got back on that horse, you've kind of had a success after success after success. So let's talk about that. Well, you know, I mean, I haven't, you know, never had the success of Blair Witch. We never, never expected to have that success again. Um, but, you know, we keep making films. And for us, it's like just making films is, um, is you know, we're, we're, you know, we're better off than, than, than most filmmakers, you know, uh, than most filmmakers that we know, you know. And I know, uh, you know, we can complain about what's going on and this and that. But at the same time, there's people out there I know that would switch places for us and with us in a second. So I, we, we know we're fortunate. We know we're lucky. Um, so just just basically continuing to make films is kind of a dream for us, and uh, we always try to, you know, we, we always try to take it cool, you know, make, stay cool with it because, uh, you know, we're making films, you know, so you can't complain too much. You know, one thing that is really interesting, someone like you, you have the the success with the Blair Witch. And you didn't pack up and move to LA and say, see you later, <laughs> DC area. Um, what, what keeps you here? Uh, you know, the, the thing about DC is that, um, you know, I grew up here and my wife grew up here, so we just feel comfortable, you know, in this surroundings. And I think that the, there's a lot of really good filmmakers in this area and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of kind of cultural uh, motivation. There's a lot of things here that kind of, that are interesting and kind of keep you, uh, um, you know, active. And uh, so we, you know, I, I, I just love being in this area. Um, and, and, and also LA to me is, uh, was, especially back then, was just kind of a really, just really scary. Um, the problem with LA, at least with, with, with the, you know, with success is that everybody wants to be your friend and everybody wants to kind of be close and, you know, everybody wants to tell you that you're brilliant and this and that. So it's a very kind of dangerous place to be. Um, you know, because eventually, I don't know, you, a lot of people just start kind of believing their own hype, you know. Um, so it was a scary place for, for me um, as far as, uh, you know, moving out there and being part of that community. And I, I spent a lot of time in L.A. just because that's the, where the work is and that's where everybody is. But I always feel, it always feels right to come back, you know. So, and if I ever move out to L.A., um, you know, it'll be under my terms and it'll be, um, you know, it'll be in a place where I'm like, okay, I know who I can trust and who I can't trust, and I have the team, and this is what I'm going to continue to work with. So, what, what do you think is the future of filmmaking in our area here? I think that the, you know, I mean, look, the future is bright. This, the, 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 the unique thing about the D.C., you know, Virginia, Maryland area is that there's uh, has diverse uh, weather and diverse locations. You know, you have 
mountains and beaches and the bay and rivers and forests and you know I mean, the only thing you don't have is desert you know um, and it has two cities two pretty big cities that have completely different looks so um, you know you have the his, you know the, his, the historical side of things so there's a lot of stuff to pull from um, and uh, and you know luckily the 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 film incentives and the stuff that's been kind of helping to bring work here is is back on its feet you know like last year was like the the best year they they've had in a long time and uh, there's a lot you know there's a few people who are you know a lot of people in you know working in the capital who are responsible for that um, the, the thing about me that what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to promote is the idea that of to help you know local uh, filmmakers because that's the, those are the most you know the people that I know mm -hmm. are, are are making films for fifty thousand bucks forty thousand bucks even less you know some people are making movies for just a couple thousand bucks so my whole thing is like trying to figure out if the incentive program can can somehow help you know the local talent because right now there's a I think there's a five or six hundred thousand minimum you know you have to spend at least five hundred thousand dollars in Maryland to get any tax incentive back and it's like I don't know you know any filmmakers that are spending that much money in Maryland you know so you it kind of uh, it kind of segregates you know the people that are making films for under that and it you know it's meant to just bring big you know movies and I think you need those big movies and big TV shows because they train you know they keep everybody you know working and you know they train everybody and it's you know it's it's real work you know and you learn from you know you're doing films with professionals but I think there's also a little what we're asking for is just a little slice of that pie to be given to you know local talent because we think that that's really the future of um, you know, at least the creative base in Maryland. Um, I mean, you can you can you can always attract people to Maryland by giving tax incentives and just giving away as much money as you can to the productions. But you can't make people. You know, the, the people that are really making films here are making them for the right reasons. They're not making them for the tax incentives. So it'd be cool to give them a little help and you know and help them just make films here. Make it a little easier to make films here. So tell us what you have going on right now. Um, I have a ton of stuff going on. I'm actually like the busiest I've been in a long time. I'm writing a, a, a reality, a pretty big reality show for ABC, and um, my partner and I are writing this. We're, we're about to uh, unleash this movie called Exists um, on the world, or at least onto the buyers. We haven't shown it to anybody yet, and uh, it's a Bigfoot movie that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it's, a, it's like the third Bigfoot movie that I've been associated with and it's the only one that we could get you know we got financed and we finally did it and the creature looks really great um, it's kind of uh, everybody that see, has seen it is really um, has reacted that way like they've never seen Bigfoot in this way so it's kind of what I wanted it really wanted to do um, and then there's a movie called VHS 2 that I directed a segment for it's it was a lot of fun it was an anthology like a first a found footage anthology um, and it's a sequel, obviously, to VHS, which came out last year. And uh, I don't know if it's going to play Maryland Film Festival. Uh, I know it's going to play Florida and Tribeca, but I'm not sure if it's doing Maryland. Um, but it's a good film. It's a fun film. And also what I loved is just the idea that, you know, I got to work. I didn't get to work directly with the filmmakers, but I've met them afterwards. But it's just cool to be in a kind of a community of uh, filmmakers that are doing similar, you know, kind of genre style films as you are. And also they're all young. We're like, Greg and I, co my partner co-directed the movie and we're all like old men compared. And, but they're all, they've all been inspired by Blair Witch and it's just kind of cool to come back and not, not really like give them advice because they're all, you know, pretty, very talented filmmakers, but just the idea of being in that, you know, community and talking to them and doing the festival rounds with them has been uh, pretty enjoyable. Um, and then I'm doing, you know, we're trying to actually do another, like a, some kind of something else, a Bigfoot thing for TV. And we're talking to a few networks about that. So um, this year is going to be pretty busy. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, we can continue to, like I said, make films and kind of live this crazy dream that we've been living. Thank you so much for spending sure. time with us this afternoon. No, really appreciate for it. Thanks for having me. For Indie Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this is Eduardo Sanchez with his film coming out, Exists, which you can find on Facebook.